Tasha? Sounds good. Okay, wonderful. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Haley Harrington. I'm the Education Director here at New Haven Reads. I'm thrilled to have everybody joining us this morning. Um, and I just want to welcome you all. We have a very full hour, so we're going to get started um, right away. I do also want to introduce, I have a, a few of my colleagues and my fellow team members here with us. Um, Natasha, it, Natasha One Green is our Outreach Director. She's going to be moderating um, today's session and taking some questions that are going to go through the chat the chat option. Um, for those of you who are following along, if you may want to um, open up the chat panel on the side of your screen, um, if, if you choose to do so, that way it doesn't pop up in the middle of our presentation. Uh, Julie Yerganian is our outreach assistant and also our assistant site director at uh, Science Park. She is going to be taking snapshots of our presentation and I also want to let everybody know this morning that we are going to be recording today's session and you'll receive a copy of that following um, our wrap up. Um, Carol Sarmiento is our Willow Street site director. She's joining us this morning, as well as Mary Connors, our literacy specialist at New Haven Reads. And Cassia Williams, our assistant education director, is also with us this morning. So we have some team members joining us. But before we get started, just a few reminders. I want to remind everybody to remain on mute. This allows us to hear our presenter um, loud and clear and give her our spotlight this morning. Um, we do encourage questions, so please send those through the chat function as well. Um, and also, I wanted to let everybody, like I said, I wanted to let everybody know we will be recording today's session. Um, so without further ado, it is absolutely my honor and I am thrilled to introduce our speaker today. Nikisha Aileen is here joining us this morning. She is a licensed clinical social worker and a licensed addiction drug counselor. She is a wife and a mother to three wonderful children. They are nine, five, and one year old. Um, she is currently working at a, as a clinical uh, coordinator at New Haven Juvenile Court and a mental health consultant for LEAP, also in New Haven. She is the owner of Aline Counseling Services, providing outpatient mental health services, training, consultation, and supervision. Nikisha has over 17 years of training experience with children, families, adolescents, and adults in inpatient and outpatient settings. She was a board member of Highville Charter School from 2010 to 2018. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to her to take us through this morning's presentation. Welcome, Nikisha. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for spending your Saturday morning with me and your colleagues. Um, big kudos to you for that one. Um, it can be very difficult on a Saturday morning when you do want to relax and when you do want to practice self-care in case, um, which is basically sleeping in late. So today we're going to be talking about the effects of COVID-19 on students. Um, and like Haley said, uh, please use the chat function. If you have questions, place it in there and we'll try to get to it as best as possible. If I'm not able to answer all your questions at the end of the presentation, then I will respond to them via email, okay? All right, so without further ado, we are all in this together. I think that is the most important thing that we can point out. This is a global pandemic and it has affected every country. Um, COVID does not discriminate based on gender, race, age, sexuality, or economic status. Um, and it affects everyone in varying degree. So with that being said, every country has had an impact. Um, here in the United States of America, we are living through it and we have others who are experiencing it. And so we know ourselves what it feels like. As safety measures that we have been encouraged to stay home. And while this is for our safety and we all understand this, all the togetherness has been stressful and overwhelming, especially for single parents. Um, some parents are working from home while taking care of children and that is an additional stressor on the family. This pandemic has left the entire world asking the same question, how long will this pandemic last? And what will life after COVID-19 look like? Uh, no one knows the answer for that. And so again, reiterated, we're all in this together. Um, this uncertainty is what we will talk about and how it affects the mental health of kids. In order to talk about students, we have to talk about students as a part of the family um, because they are youth, they do have adults that are taking care of them. For some of our youths, being at home is taken away a safe place. Um, in some of the school systems in New Haven, for example, we have clinics in the program, we have social worker in the school system, we have trusted adults who check in frequently on our kids um, in the form of paraprofessional, those kids who are special education, who needs additional services. Those are some of the things that have been left out. Um, the church, which is an additional support system. 
um, that has been taken away. Um, sports, which gives kids an opportunity to be successful and be active, that has also been taken away, unintentionally, of course. And being at home for some of our kids have exposed them to a greater incident of domestic violence, um, community violence and child abuse, unfortunately. Some of our families in New Haven have suffered financial instability due to the loss of job, making it harder for parents to provide food and shelter. Uh, they have a lot of programs in New Haven that are trying to remedy that by providing breakfast and lunch where school students are able to get those things provided at identified schools that is listed on the website, um, the New Haven public school websites. We have families who are grieving the loss of lo loved ones. And um, we have, with everyone being home, the togetherness has affected the daily routines and the structure. Uh, because of this, this has impacted parents' abilities to parent consistently. So whereas before, um, families were used to the structure and the routine of waking up, going to school, after school programs, coming home, and then you have a couple of hours at home with family um, before going to bed and repeating the cycle, that is gone. Without the structure and the routine in the home, parents are left to kind of figure out how to adjust, and that has affected their ability to parent consistently. We've also seen that sibling, history, um, sibling issues and conflicts have become more intensive with family members. Um, whereas you were able to leave the house, for example, and take some space, space is at home. So that has impacted that as well. The stress of parents are felt in the household as well. Um, like I said, students are a part of the family and as a part of the family, what happens to the parents trickle down to those students. So if parents are stressed, whether it's financial, whether it's emotionally, then children feel that as well. What are some of the professionals seeing? Um, therapists are noting an increase in anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, and substance abuse. Police officers are seeing an increase in violent crimes and car thefts. Hospitals are seeing an increase in emergency room visits related to children's mental health, with adolescents 12 to 8, 17, making up the highest proportion of that. And there's a higher need for treatment around substance abuse, detoxification, and inpatient. With inpatients being full, unfortunately, that means there's a longer wait list. So people with substance abuse difficulties are finding it harder to get the treatment that they need. So what does anxiety and depression look like in younger kids? Um, I'm talking about generally, um, and again, these are just some of the signs and symptoms. And so if, if you see a child experiencing one, doesn't necessarily mean they're having anxiety or depression. It just means that they they might be having a hard time. Um, so when we're talking about this or when I'm talking about this, you're talking about how many of these signs and symptoms are you seeing and how long has um, have they presented themselves. So for the younger kids, we're seeing disruptive behavior that could be new, it could be ongoing, um, irritability. Sometimes it looks like tantruming, whining, yelling, and crying with difficulties consoling that child. So um, if a child is crying and it's taking a longer and longer periods of time to console that child, it could be more than just whatever triggered the incident. We're seeing changes in moods that's not typical for the child. Um, and again, this is what's atypical for a child. What we're seeing is some kids already had um, some symptoms of being sad and anxious. And so being at home for this long period, we're just seeing some of these symptoms being intensified, right? So newly developed fear of the dark, trouble separating from parents or being alone, loss of appetite, a decrease or increase in energy, and again, this is a little bit tricky because um, to a certain degree, it is if a kid is lethargic, for example, if they're always tired, or if a kid is really, really hyper, which is not typically like them, just having this excessive energy that for whatever reason, um, you're having a hard time bringing that energy down. Decreased interest in playing with toys and playing with parents and regression in previously obtained milestones. So for example, a child who was fully potty drained now is bedwetted or having um, many accidents during the daytime. That's a sign that there's something happening as well. And if you're seeing themes of death and dying in play, anxiety and depression in middle aged students, some of them may overlap with the younger kids. For example, the change in mood, that's not typical for the child, ongoing irritability, you have feelings of hopelessness, frequent conflict with friends and family, little interest in text and video chatting and social media, 
difficulties falling asleep and staying asleep, sometimes sleeping way too much, sometimes sleeping way too little. Changes in weight or eat pattern or eat in pattern, excuse me, difficulties with memory, thinking or concentration, low interest in schoolwork, changes in appearance. Um, and again, we have to put it in the context of COVID-19. A lot of people have made some adjustment with basic hygiene. Um, so if that child is taking a shower every other day, that is considered typical during this um, COVID-19 time when a lot of people are staying home and doing a little less in terms of grooming. Thoughts of suicide or death, excessive worries and fears, persistent sadness, easily tearful with no consoling again, non-compliance, which is not typical for that child, fighting with siblings and family where um, before this wasn't present. And then for the teenagers, I'm not gonna repeat everything, but all those symptoms that were for the younger kids, those would be present in teenagers as well. In addition to the low interest in schoolwork or significant drop in academic effort. So this child who was so focused on doing well in school and pre on preparing for college, and now they have no interest in the schoolwork at all, can't see past high school, not even interested in talking about college. Those are some of the signs. Drug and alcohol use, increase in risky and reckless behavior and becoming body conscious with low self-esteem. So in your role with New Haven Reads, what should you be looking for? You're looking for changes in mood that is unusual for the youth. And for some of you, you have um, a long relationship with these youths. And so um, you have a sense of what their personality is typically like. So if there's a change in mood that is unusual for the youth, that is a sign problems with thinking, memory or concentration, regression in academic growth, questions around death and dying, which is ongoing, avoidance of activities previously enjoyed, again, behavior problems such as non-compliance, fight in. Um, what I didn't include though is involvement in the juvenile justice system as well. That is a sign and a concern. So anything that is out of the norm for the youth that may be an indicator that they're having a difficult time. What can be done? This is the question that many are asking. And while there is a vaccine, there's no end in sight for COVID-19 and the restrictions that comes with it. The ongoing stress, fear, grief, and uncertainty created by COVID-19 has caused emotional distress for everyone, children and adults alike. And again, we're all in this together. And so as adults, we are having some of those similar um, experiences as well. You can check in often with children, watch and listen for signs that they're struggling. Keep in mind that younger children may not know how to talk about their feelings or their behaviors, but you can often see it in play and you can often see it in um, how they treat their toys, for example, the artwork that they're drawing, for example. And so just being a little bit more aware of it. Preteens and adolescents may try to hide their struggles because of fear, shame, or a sense of responsibility to avoid burdening others. Again, um, I would encourage you, um, especially for the teenagers, if they feel that you are able to handle their stress, then they will feel more comfortable sharing their stress with you. So if you're having a hard time, be open with them. They will be receptive to that. Um, if you see them struggling, ask questions. They're okay with that as well. And if they're not okay, our teenagers will let you know that it's not okay. So if I'm concerned, what should I do? First, ask yourself, try to figure out, am I concerned about the youth's general well-being or mental health? What exactly am I concerned about? That way, you'll be able to tune in a little bit more to what you should be paying attention to. Tutors may ask questions about the child's day or how they're feeling. One thing that I would say is um, try not to be too intrusive. So asking someone, how was your day? That is not intrusive. Asking someone, how are you feeling today? That's not intrusive. And I say that because it gives them the opportunity to decide how much or how little to share. Uh, we are not detectives. And so it is very difficult to ask those hard questions if you don't have the time, if you don't have the expertise, and if you're not willing to sit with that child and go a little bit deeper. So that's why I would say, 
open up with how was your day? How are you feeling? And that gives the child the opportunity to decide what they will or will not share. Use choice time as a way to process with all children so that they can um, share their feelings. And if you have a particular concern for a child, you don't um, single out that child. So they feel as if they're a part of the group and that you're concerned about the group in general. This might give them um, that sense of comfort that they need to share. Please notify your supervisors. They might request a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the youth in a breakout room. So if you have any concerns, right? If you were thinking, am I concerned about this child's general well-being or am I concerned about this child's mental health? Definitely talk to your supervisor about it. Tutors can process concerns in depth and share knowledge of the student with the assistant site director or site director in order to determine next course of action. You have the assistant site director and site director at hand. And so I would say the more people you talk to about the concerns in terms of your supervisors, the more likely it is that you guys can come up with a course of action. Site director or assistant site director may ask the question, the youth more questions, but in asking questions again, it's important to allow the youth to decide what to share. Um, asking general questions is okay. Asking specific questions for the site director, assistant site director is okay as well. But again, you wanna make sure if you decide to do that in terms of the site director or um, the assistant site director, that you have the time and the space to sit with that youth and to get all the details and process that information. Now there is a list of who you should contact in terms of the Bristol site, the Dixwell site, Science Park and Willow Street. So that will be provided to you as well. Now I'm going to check in with Natasha really quick to find out if we have any questions. So we have one, um, it says, I don't feel comfortable using diagnostic language. Can I just write a report what behaviors I just experienced with my student? So I think we need to clarify perhaps. Good question. So again, um, just to kind of go back a little bit, um, asking yourself, what am I concerned about with the youth is going to give you a good starting point. Um, we are not, I am not asking you to diagnose a child and I am most certainly not asking you to ask them um, in terms of depression or anxiety, are you feeling these things? Again, what you're looking for is the signs and the symptoms that you are seeing with this child that is outside of the norm. So for example, if you are seeing that this child is having a hard time focusing and participating the way that they previously did, this might be something to wonder, hey, is everything okay with this child, right? So what you're basically doing is trying to create a checklist of what your concerns are. So you can then go back to your site director and say, hey, I'm having concern with this particular child. This is what I'm seeing. What do you think we should do? And the site director would take it from there. So thank you so much for clarifying that. And that's all the questions so far. All right. So again, these are the um, who should I contact in terms of Bristol, Dixwell, Science Park, and Willow Street. These are the people that you can contact and again, share those concerns with. Um, I'm not sure if, if many of you have heard the term um, mandated reporters before. Um, but by law in Connecticut, people in certain professions and occupations that have contact with children or whose primary focus is children must report suspected child abuse or neglect. These are called mandated reporters and they must make the report, which is called a DCF 136 and that's available online. If you just type in DCF 136 um, Connecticut in Google, when in the ordinary course of their employment or profession, they have reasonable cause to believe or suspect that a child under 18 is being abused, neglected, or placed in imminent risk or serious harm. Um, mandated reporters are notified of their status upon hire. So if you are not notified um, as a intern or as an employee of New Haven Reads, then that means they do not consider you to be um, a mandated reporter. But if at any, if you are unsure 
um, please contact your supervisor and find out from them if you are a mandated reporter. Um, the site director and the assistant site director are definitely considered mandated reporter. Um, so if anything has to happen, it would go through them. But if you are identified as a mandated reporter, um, consult your assistant site director and site director before making any referral to the DCF hotline. That way they're aware of what's happening in terms of with that child and they're aware um, that a report has been made and can keep their eye open. Um, there's usually a response when you make a report. And so um, you wanna find out what happened to that child. There's also, I left um, a link on the bottom that is a free training, free online training um, that you can tap into if you are interested in figuring out what being a mandated reporter is all about. Um, one big question I typically get asked um, or typically get asked is, after you make a report, does that affect the relationship with that family? And for me, in my position, I'm very clear. Um, and again, that's why it's important to know your role if you are a mandated reporter. When I start working with any family, I tell them in advance that I am a mandated reporter and that if at any point the child or if they report that a child has been physically, sexually, emotionally abused, then it is outside of my hand, I do have to report it. So some clients I've had for extended period of time, a year, two years. And so if that comes up, if someone reports to me, hey, I was so upset with my, um, my child the other day that I hit them with a hockey stick, for example. I will pause and I will let them know. I will remind them just to let you know, I am a mandated reporter. It is not okay to hit your child with a hockey stick and I do have to call it in. I've given people the options just to maintain that relationship of being with me while I call in that report so they can hear exactly what I'm saying. And I do that just to ensure that they understand that our relationship that we have, the working relationship, um, relationship is still important, but I still have to do my job as a mandated reporter. So I do give them that option to sit with me and to listen to exactly what I'm saying. And then I also walk them through the steps of what will happen um, should DCF re respond to that. I'm also a support for them after DCF, DCF shows up. So I get a release of information and that way I'm able to talk to DCF and let them know what I'm working on the child with, um, what I'm working on the family with and what progress we've made, for example, and if we're working on any parental skills. So again, the question, mandated reporter, if you're not sure, definitely ask your assistant site director and your site director and does, making a report affect your relationship? It does, but it doesn't mean that it has to end the relationship. I think if you are open when you're making that report, then it's more likely that you will be able to maintain that relationship after you have to report um, abuse or neglect. So this slide gives an example of some of the people who are considered mandated reporters. Um, licensed physician, surgeons, interns in the hospital, registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, medical examiners, dentists, dental hygienists, um, addiction and drug counselors, marriage and family therapists, anyone working with um, sexual assault or domestic violent victims, so the counselors, um, licensed foster parents, psychologists, school employees, coaches, social workers, police, op um, police officers, juvenile probation officers, members of the clergy, pharmacists, physical therapists, optometrists, chiropractor, podiatrists, um, any licensed or certified medical services. Um, the most recent one that was added, of course, was the coaches because coaches do have contact with kids and they are in a position where they do get to see if a child, for example, has been physically abused. Um, whether the child is wearing um, basketball shorts or has to change the baseball or whatever, if they see something, they are now required to say something as well. Um, this slide is about self-care, but I wanna go back um, just for a little bit. So New Haven, I believe the school system does have some kids who have returned to school. So we have the younger age kids are given the option of returning in person. And I do believe that is the pre-K, um, kindergarten 
first grade and perhaps the second grade as well. Um, I do believe that they will be moving forward with um, in March, I believe, to give the older kids the option of coming into school as well. Um, not really sure how, how many people are going to take up that offer. I know some people are in school right now, some are not in school. Um, and it does depend on if you're a public school, if you're a charter school and things like that. Um, surrounding towns do have students back in school. My kids attend North Haven Public School and they have been back in. And what I will say in terms of the return to school is that it is anxiety provoking for our kids who are going in. There is a sense of nervousness. What is going to happen? There's a lot of questions. What can I do? What can't I do, right? Um, can I touch my friends? Can I play with my friends? Can I talk to my friends? And um, the schools have done a really good job of preparing the kids and informing them of the requirements. So they still are required the six to stand six feet apart. Um, they are required to keep their face mask on at all times. They do schedule face mask break. And so they do have that opportunity where they can either go outside or go in the gym and put their mask down and get some fresh air. Um, they have made adjustment to recess. So the kids have their own individual, at least um, in the surrounding towns, have their own individual recess pack, so to speak. And so they have toys and activities that they can play um, by themselves um, with kids surrounding them. They also have, I'm, I'm not sure how many of you guys have heard of, of Among Us, depending on um, how involved or how in tune you are with the kids, but they're able to play Among Us, um, which gives them the opportunity to kind of space out and figure out who um, in the group is an imposter. That allows them space, um, interaction, but no touching. Um, do we have any questions, Natasha? We sure do. So we have a lot of questions around being mandated reporters. So okay. um, one is just to clarify, are we the tutors considered mandated reporters? And I can speak to that. Uh, yes. As a volunteer at New Haven Reads, you are not a mandated reporter. Uh, you would have to go through the training and be certified, but your a site director and assistant site director are mandated reporters. So they have gone through the training. Um, and then the other question about mandated reporters that I thought was interesting is I have a mandated reporter question. If I, uh, so if one is a mandated reporter in one's primary profession, is one also a mandated reporter in the volunteer work like at New Haven Reads? Do you want me to take that, Natasha? Yes, please. Okay, so I'm not sure of what your policy is, but in terms of all the trainings that I've been to, once you're a mandated reporter, you are a mandated reporter everywhere, right? So that puts you in kind of an interesting place because if you're at the grocery store, for example, and you see something, right, um, what should you do? And the general consensus around that is if you see something, say something. You would not be able to call in a DCF 136 from the grocery store, but people have gone up and just say, hey, are you okay? So if you are a mandated reporter in your primary job and you are volunteering for New Haven Reads, then you are still a mandated reporter. But I would definitely check in with your site director and assistant site director before you make any reports. It is important for them to understand what you're seeing, what your concerns are, and um, what's happening for their organization. And in addition to that, um, like Natasha said, you do have to be cert, you do have to go through the mandated reporter training and get a certificate. So they would need a copy of your certificate as well. I think that's a good way to move forward. Yeah, and just to kind of go back with the question about Tudor, Natasha. Even though you are not a mandated reporter, um, as a tutor, you do have assistant site director and site director. And so communication is key. If you have concerns about that, about being um, anyone being abused in any way um, or neglected, then definitely communicate that to the site director and the assistant site director. That way they are aware of it and can also, if need be, have follow-up conversation with this child to make sure that they're okay. And that way, if a um, DCF-136 has to be made, that they will, they will take the lead and do that. 
And then I got a question about uh, if they, if the site directors think it's helpful for the volunteers to do the mandated reporter training, just in terms of understanding it more thoroughly. Um, I, from my perspective, if you feel like you would like to understand what that role is, you can definitely do a little bit of research. Um, but we do not require you to be a mandated reporter as a volunteer at New Haven Reads. Um, so we are getting some other questions uh, on other things, but I think some of them you might be covering a little bit later on. Um, okay. So maybe we'll go through those first and then we'll, we'll go back through and see if there's any that we, we feel like we need to cover. Okay. Um, so I put a slide in for self-care and that is more for you guys, the volunteer, the workers. Um, Self-care for all is very important. This is a difficult time and a lot of the focus is on the work you do. But in order for you to do the work you do, you yourself have to be okay. You yourself have to care for yourself. And so self-care for all is important. Um, care for you so you can better care for others. If you are not okay, there's no way that you can help someone else be okay, if that makes sense. So prioritize your needs, um, plan enjoyable and restorative activities. I've found for me during this COVID-19 time, and again, uh, it was very open. I, I do have three kids and I have a full-time and a part-time job. So for me, I have, I have basically taken this time to figure out some of the things that I like, right? Um, in your day-to-day -day when you've been so busy, um, you are moving, you're constantly on the go. And so you do what has to be done and you don't take the time to figure out, hey, I'm at a different place in my life now. What do I like to do? Um, so exploring those things, right? If you were an artist before, but you stop painting or you stop um, pottery or you stop woodwork, now is the time to potentially figure out, am I still interested in this? Um, and kind of go back to that. Accept support from others. That is a huge one. Um, if there are people in your life who are willing to offer you support, utilize that support, right? Um, it is okay to accept help. We, um, in this profession that we're in, you guys are interns, um, you guys are volunteer, which means that you are helping others, but receiving that help is sometimes very difficult. If you're being offered the support, especially during this time, accept the support from others. It could be something as simple as, hey, I'm gonna drop off a meal accept the support. It could be something um, others might say, hey, I haven't heard from you as much. Is it okay? Can we Zoom? Can we um, do a video chat? Accept that support. If you are a parent or a grandparent, whatever you do, if someone is offering assistance to kind of lighten that load, accept the help. Engage in mindfulness. So for a lot of people, this was not primary practice, like I mentioned before. Um, Pre-COVID, a lot of people, it was just go, go, go. Now is the time to explore that, explore yoga, um, exercising, right? You don't have to be a bodybuilder, but um, exercising 10 or 15 minutes a day um, does wonders. Get enough sleep. That is a huge one. Get enough sleep. If you are not replenishing your body with sleep, it's hard to expect your body to um, produce at 100%. Express yourself creatively, um, creatively, like I said before. Explore those um past creativity, or even new ones that you had interest in. Stay connected to loved ones. It's okay to call. Um, it's okay to use technology, right? Um, there's Zoom, there's Facebook, there's WhatsApp. There's so many different ways to stay in contact, not just with people in the United States, but if you have family and friends in other countries too. It's cold outside, but feel free to go outside for a walk, go outside for a hike. Um, do something just for you. It's okay to do that as well. So some of the questions that came in before, what are some of the short-term and long-term effects of social distancing on the different age group and how can we mitigate that? That is a huge question. That is an important question. And some of that we will not have an answer to until we are kind of out of COVID because we are not we're still in the thick of it, believe it or not. It is, I would say about a year now or almost a year. Well, almost a year because we're still in January and we're still, we're still going through it. Um, 
people are getting vaccinated, but we're not even halfway through. So um, post, we're not really sure yet, but we can we can guess um, some of those and, and I'll go through it. So the effect of social distancing is believed to be impacted more on you on the youth's personality. So for example, um, extrovert and introverts. Um, extroverts will be more capable or more likely to maintain friendships during the pandemic. Um, and that is a key role in staying grounded and staying connected to others and feeling hopeful. And so we can only assume that transitioning post COVID or transitioning back to school and then post COVID, I mean, even back into the summertime that the transition will be done with friends intact and having that support system, having uh, people you can talk to, that helps with any transition. So the extroverts are believed to be more likely um, that they will transition post COVID more effectively than those that are um, introverted. So the introverted youth, um, those are the youth that are shy. They prefer to kind of be by themselves, um, are not very social, um, at least not in big groups, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, but in big groups, they're not, they might have the one or two friends at most. So with the required social interaction, so school, church, and sports, with those being removed, the introvert tends to become more isolative. And those are the kids that we, we tend to worry a lot more about because they are by themselves more often and they're not talking as much. So to mitigate this, we encourage, um, and for parents sometimes, even arrange social interactions, right? Um, so when it was warmer outside, for example, making, meeting at a park, um, or now when it's cold for those kids who are interested in video games, they have the social, they have the, um, the function on the video game where you can actually connect with specific peers and you're talking to that peer as you're playing. That is one way to kind of mitigate that. Encourage that youth, if they do have a best friend, to either, again, whether it's um, Facebook, whether it's the WhatsApp, whether it's the Zoom, just have some um, kind of face-to-face well, not face to face, but um, kind of the way we're doing it right now to have that interaction, to see that person's face, even if it's over screen. So again, this can be done via telecommunication based on the youth's interest. Um, when in-person is not an, in an option, video chat is the next best thing. So utilize that. Um, Again, kids are doing Zoom in school, so that is a little bit frustrating, but uh, to then have them meet up here on this kind of um, telecommunication. But if it's more social as opposed to school, kids are more open to doing it. They see it as more fun. Um, again, some schools have returned in-person to in-person learning with limitations, whether it's a six feet distance. Um, I do believe some schools have made that um, modification to four feet, believe it or not. Um, they have masks with mask bags throughout the day. And so the short term, some schools are seeing it right now. Um, I don't think New Haven has been back for that long yet to see some of the short term effects on it. Um, the concern is usually Again, depending on the, the youth's personality. So that the introvert are the ones that are usually shy. Um, a loner, um, those are the ones that we worry about because again, when you're not forced to interact with others, they naturally would prefer to be by themselves and so they're not communicating as much with others. Um, and those are the concerns. Um, with the younger kids, now we're talking about the pre-K, the kindergarten, the first grades, um, where being in person and learning was, it's hands-on. So for those kids, they are missing out on not just the learning, um, piece in terms of now they're doing Zoom, but they don't have the tactile things that they would be touching. They don't have the Play-Doh that they would be playing together. They don't have, they're not building on their social cues. They're not working together with their partner in, in the kitchen, for example, or pretend play. Those are the kids that um, you're more concerned about the short-term effects because they're not learning the social cue. So what we might see is as they transition back, they will just be, um, there There might be a little lag. So they will have to learn things at a later date that um, if they were in school, these are things that they would be practicing more often. They're just learning it at a later date, unfortunately. How can we help students 
stay motivated and focused on learning amid home distraction, instability in the world, and Zoom fatigue? This was a really good question. Um, so children and even teenagers love being rewarded. And yes, to a certain degree, it's bribing, but I try not to look at it like that. I try to look at it as they are being motivated and they're being rewarded for um, doing the things that they should be doing, yes, but the things that we know is hard for them to be doing at this point. So um, <clears throat> people can use a creative reward system. Um, for example, in my house, um, they earn the opportunity to pick what games we play, for example. They earn the opportunity to give their peer, uh, their, sis, their sibling, um, the chore for the day. So I, I try to be creative in terms of the things that I am rewarding them with. Um, but creating a reward system, using your own creativity, whatever it looks like, is a way to motivate kids to learn, right? Um, if you want the kid to learn, uh, to read a book, for example, maybe attaching something at the end of when they read that book might be a way to get them. So yes, are they really interested in reading the book? Probably not. But um, if they want to get to the reward, they'll read it for the reward. <laughs> and so bribing a little bit, but I, I choose to look at it as rewarding that kid and trying to get them to be motivated. Normalize feelings for kids, right? Acknowledge that this is a crazy time. Acknowledge that it's unpredictable. Acknowledge that, hey, I'm having a hard time too, right? But these are some of the things that I've done. Be honest about what we can and what we cannot control for the kids. Um, reinforce that we can get through it together. And again, Honesty, honesty, honesty. Acknowledge it. This is a tough time. Um, that's the best that we can do for our kids is to be honest. Set mini goals because for a lot of our kids, for example, what I'm seeing, especially the, I'm talking about like the seniors, for example, they're having a really hard time thinking about and, and being motivated to complete the schoolwork in order to get to college, even though before that was their biggest goal, right? To get good grades so I can get into college. Because we've been in this pandemic for so long, seeing the next phase or going off to college, is it there somewhere in there, but it's not their focus at this point. So what I've done is we have worked on setting mini goals. That way we can kind of um, get through the day, for example, get through the week, for example, rather than looking at the big goal. Whereas before we could motivate them, you wanna get into college, right? That's no longer a motivation. So getting through the day, getting through the week, setting mini goals, small goals. Um, and um, yeah, focusing on the here and now instead of the future sometimes is better for that youth. Zoom fatigue is real. I do believe it. Um, for those of you guys who are working from home, for those of you guys who um, are spending a lot of time on screen, it is real. Um, your eyes get tired and to a certain degree, you get tired of just looking into a screen. Um, it is real. Um, be aware of it and plan breaks throughout. That's the best that you can do. Plan breaks um, that include physical activity, especially if, it, if these are for things that the kids have to do. And like I said before, if the kids are on telecommunication for fun, they are fine with it. My kids come, oh, I have a meeting with so-and-so at 7.15 tonight. They've made their own arrangement with meeting up um, their friends on whether it's Zoom or um, like I said, WhatsApp. They've made their own arrangement. However, when it comes to doing schoolwork and sitting still in front of the screen for long periods of time to do work, that is harder. And so they get they're over it by the time they sometimes get to the opportunity to um, to get to New Haven Reads, for example. But um, with fun activities, with making it fun, with being engaging, you can re-engage them back into it. So um, use physical, physical activity and using reward system that has been successful for some kids. Next question, how can we balance empathy with expectation? That's a tough one, right? Um, so even though it's hard, studies show that kids function better with structure and with consistency. And so I would say focus on the expectation piece first and then practice empathy. So it is important for the child to understand what those expectations are, 
right? So that is the first thing. These are the expectations. This is what I expect you to do. Make sure the expectations are clear and then be prepared to assist the youth problem solving to identify any barriers. So what made it difficult for you to, to meet this expectation? Let's talk about how we can fix those things so that you meet the expectation, right? And then the other way is if this youth is consistently not meeting the expectation, then you have to kind of evaluate if this is realistic for the youth and if you need to make an adjustment. And if that's the case, then just communicate back what the new expectation is. But going into it, that youth has to have a very good understanding of what the expectations are. And from there, then you can kind of empathize with how difficult it is during this time and figure out problem solve with the youth, what made it hard, and then figure out some of the solutions to those things. But again, having a consistent expectation for that youth is important. In this play, in this time when things are so out of control, it's important to keep some things, the, the structure, the consistency, to keep those things in place because it does provide youth with a sense of security. They won't tell you and um, it won't show, but um, studies have shown that structure and consistency is, is what helps kids to stay grounded. And we're going to move on to the next question. Should we bring up questions of emotional well-being or let the student raise the topic? I say feel free to check in and ask questions about emotional well-being. How was your day? How are you feeling today? Again, those questions are broad enough so that it opens the door, but the kid decides how much can I share? How much should I share? How much am I willing to share in this moment? It's important for that youth to guide the direction of that conversation. You open the door and they direct you to where they wanna go. That's how I look at it. What approach, um, what should our approach be like for different age group? Younger kids will respond better to play or storytelling, right? Adolescents and teenagers respond better to a direct approach. In your role, like I said before, it is better to open the door and allow the youth to act, to, um, to direct you as to where they wanna go. But however you decide, um, like whatever words you choose to use, are you okay? Be authentic to yourself and then stick to what is comfortable for you. So for me in working with teenagers, and again, because of my job as a social worker, I tend to be more direct. And that again is because of my expertise and because for me, I can handle it. Um, but for if you are just um, assisting that kid, if you are only seeing that kid for 30 minutes, for example, at, at a time, then I would not be direct with that child. I would, again, just open the door and kind of allow them to, to, to tell you where it is that they want to go. Ask the question, are you OK? Do you want to talk? You seem... Um, you seem sad, is everything okay? That's fine. What do we do, um, I'm sorry, what do we know about how children are perceiving this time of isolation and remote learning and how are they filling their time? And that is a really good question. So children are perceiving this time of isolation and remote learning as unfair. We are too, to a certain degree, aren't we? Um, I know for me, especially when the pandemic first started, um, I was at home, the kids were at home, um, I still had to work. And for me, this is not what I signed up for. I did not sign up and it sounds horrible, but this is not what I signed up for. And so I felt like this is so unfair. Um, but in, as time progressed, right, we're now, like I said, almost a year in, you kind of figure out the groove, you kind of figure out what should I do, what makes my life during this time a little bit easier, what makes it more manageable. So for the kids, they're perceiving um, this isolation, or at least in the very beginning, as unfair. Um, they perceive this as punishment to a certain degree. What did I do wrong? Uh, why can't I see my friends? Those are some of the questions that were being asked, but uh, they have mixed emotion the same way we have mixed emotion about this. Some youth are enjoying being at home. Some youth enjoyed um, just kind of logging on on their bed, right? Um, lounging around in their pajamas. 
with less pressure, right? Because I think the schools have also modified what it is that they expect from their youth in terms of academic performance. Um, at home though, a lot of parents are hearing, I'm bored. That is the frequent, frequent statement, I'm bored. Um, and this has resulted in a lot of freedom for, for the kids to choose what activities they wanna do. The kids seem to be filling their time, like I said, and it's unfortunate because we spoke about Zoom fatigue, but Zoom fatigue seems to only apply to the academic setting, right? So they have filled their time with more screen time, whether it's television, um, whether it's their own iPad, whether it's video games. And some kids have utilized it by playing more, by spending more time with their sibling, by spending more time with their family. So we have a wide array of, of what kids are doing. Any question, any other questions, Natasha? We do. So um, some, there's some sort of, it's a general question about their students not turning their video on. Mm -hmm. um, so since I can't see him, should I respect his privacy or ask him to turn it on sometimes so that we can make a face-to-face? -face? That is, that is a good one. And like I said, I'm a therapist too. So <laughs> I, I call my, my clients and for an hour and I have kids from four all the way up, right? And what I do is for at least for a second, I would say, I ask them, hey, I need to see your face for a second. I say, hey, I wanna see your face. I wanna see, you know, I'm gonna make sure that you're okay. And so I think it's it's kind of that negotiation piece where it's like, let me see you, let me lay eyes on you, see that you're okay. And then you can turn it back off, right? Because the reality is for some kids, it's easier to just turn the camera off. For some kids, in my experience, if I'm talking about something difficult, it's easier for them not to be on camera or it's easier for them to be doing something. I have some, um, some of my teenagers while I'm talking to them, they're doing their makeup. And that is perfectly fine by me as long as we're talking, right? So I would say if you're willing to negotiate, do it as long as they're participating. I say, hey, let me see your face real quick. Let me make sure that you're okay. And then you can turn it back on. Maybe that can be the negotiation. Or if, if you wanna do every other time. But for me, I wanna see you for the um, at least for a second and then you can turn it back on. Awesome. Um, and then the other one was about uh, what are good ways to incorporate emotions and feelings into choice time for younger students uh, so it seems fun and not intrusive. So um, for me, and, and again, it might not be practical for you, right, because of your setting and kind of what you're doing. Um, I've done Let's Create a Story where I will start the story and each kid can add to the story or I can create a box, you know, you can create a box, um, put different feelings in it. And again, it's not going to be diagnostic, right? But it can almost like the feeling chart, but in a box. And so I would, um, for example, with all the feelings in a box, I would give a child, I'm not sure if you're doing individual or in a group. So if it's individual, then you have the box. So you just kind of shake it around, pick a feeling out. And then either you guys can do it together. You talk about a feeling, they talk about that same feeling, but that way you're introducing lots of different feelings to the child as well, so that they have that in their vocabulary to explain how they're feeling, maybe not to you, but to their parent. So those are some options, but I say um, use your creativity, especially um, around this time. If you have the feeling chart posted up, then you can um, almost do like a blind, like pick a number and then you count the number of square and kind of wherever you land, that's the feeling you talk about. Or you can just um, have someone randomly pick. Um, you can do alphabetically, for example, um, say your ABCs in your head, I'll tell you when to stop and then find a feeling that's connected to it and talk about that feeling. So I would say just um, be creative with it. Um, we can go for days as to different things that we can kind of try to do to get feelings in there. But um, if you Google it, the feeling chart is all over and that gives you a wide range of different feelings that you can either bring up or that you can um, have access to and introduce to the kids. Awesome, so there was the same question, but for teens. So talking to older students about 
feelings or suggestions in choice time activities? Teenagers are harder. I'll admit it, <laughs> especially when it comes to um, uh, talking to them about feelings, because a lot of it is based on where they want to go if they want to talk about feelings. Um, it might be easier. And again, um, if it's in the context of New Haven Read, I'm not really sure how much time you would have to kind of go into it, but um, find out what they're into. I tend to use a lot based on what they're watching, for example. If I know a teenager is into a particular show or if that's all the rave for teenagers, then I wanna make sure that I'm in the know. And I will talk to them about a specific character being mindful of what it is that I want to talk about, right? So if I want to talk about anger, if I want to talk about feelings, um, anxiety, if I want to talk about this character who was just so angry or um, behaviors that the character showed, I would know the, know what they're into. I would pick a character and I would talk to them about that character, not so much themselves, right? But about the character, because what I'm trying to do is introduce to them different feelings, different emotion, and having them be okay with talking about it, even if it's not about them. So that when I do open that door and say, hey, how are you feeling today? That they have that capability of doing it with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I think this is the last one. Uh, so are we as older parents causing some of the problems in children's worry about our safety? That is, a, that is a good question. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to blame the parent, but what I can say is that kids are very in tune with their parents, right? Um, I practice openness personally with my kids only because I can't, I can't hide my emotions. So for me, it's better to be upfront. Um, one of the things I tell parents, especially when it comes to the pandemic, is be aware of when your child is up and what you're watching on TV. So if you're constantly, constantly watching a, about the pandemic, that means they're constantly overhearing about the pandemic as well, right? Um, if we are worried about something in particular and you're aware that your child knows this, then have a conversation with them. I think for the most part, when you see something, especially with the kids, and we don't say anything, then to a certain degree, we're just not helping them. We might not be the cause of it, but we're just not helping them. We're not helping them talk about it, manage it, kind of putting it out there. And that way, whatever they're thinking, they're left to, like, my daughter's nine. So I'm leaving her to her nine-year-old interpretation of what she overheard versus helping her say it out loud and then me explaining to her what it really is. I'm not sure if that helped. Um, I hope it did though. Um, we, we don't cause, but I think there are more opportunities for us to help, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it for questions. And we, we're getting a lot of thank yous. Some people are having to leave. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, and obviously for Nikisha for this wonderful, uh, informative presentation. Um, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank Thanks, you everybody. guys. Bye. <laughs>